Good evening. Uh, this is the Hingham Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday evening, December 12, 2017. Uh, Selectman Johnson is representing the board at another meeting this evening that starts at 7, so uh, she will be joining the meeting uh, later, on, later on this evening. Uh, first item of business is the approval of the minutes from our December 5th session. So moved. Uh, second, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Okay, first item of business is uh, Burton's Grill, change of manager. Hi, could you come up to the table and please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Elena Ford. Hi, Hello. And um, you are um, you are the new manager. I'm the general manager of the, the Hingham location. Yes. Okay. And um, uh, I know we have some paperwork here, but your background. Have you been with Burton's? I've been with Burton's three years, two months. Okay. I've been in the business 26 years. Okay. And Tom, all the licensing and all of the everything's in order. Everything yes. is in order. Terrific, Paul. Do you have any questions? No, no I'm good. Have you been in the Hingham location before, or? Um, I'm from the South Shore originally. Oh, I grew up in Citrus, so um, I traveled with Burton's. I was in their Nashua location, and I was in their North Andover, and wanted to get back here, so the opportunity arose, and I came back to South Shore a couple years ago. Oh, terrific! Um, well, it's a uh, it's a wonderful place. Thank you. So. Um, would you like to make a sure. motion? I move to approve the request of Burton's Grill of Hingham LLC DBA Burton's Grill for a change of manager to Elena Ford, subject to the approval of the Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Ford, welcome. Oh, thank you, thank so you much. for coming in Mr. this Lord. evening. Happy thank holidays. You. you too. Okay. Um, the next, uh, we have a couple of uh, votes that we have to take and um, one of them is a follow-up to a presentation that the board had last week from the Harbor Development Committee uh, with respect to the design of the uh, Inner Harbor Wall Heights. And um, uh, Chair of the Harbor Development Committee, Mr. Reardon, um, presented the board with the recommendation and a, a lot of great information um, and a recommendation that the elevation range from 10 and a half to 11 feet. We had asked and Bill thank you for a week to just review all the information follow up on any questions um, and uh, did I don't know if you had any questions Paul no I, I'm good I, I enjoyed the presentation very thorough complete yep and um, I'm sad. yeah I think I'm I'm prepared to vote as well I thought the um, the information is very helpful, in particular the charts that showed where things were relative to other places. I know there's a question that's come up with, with respect to a pumping station, and I, I might suggest that we ask the interim town administrator to follow up with the sewer commission, because Bill, it's, it strikes me that they're kind of the appropriate, they, are. they would be the appropriate group. So um, I think, uh, I think even though we might, even though our harbor improvement plan will raise the height of the harbor walls so that to prevent water from coming over um, it, it seems to me that that's a point of vulnerability and it would it wouldn't hurt to explore what's involved in doing that it was an identified vulnerability that, that Kleinfeld had brought to yes. our attention yes um, so uh, any any other comments no. okay are there any comments from the audience Okay, um, would you like to make a motion? Sure, I'll move to affirm the recommended action set forth by the Harbor Development Committee to design the inner horror wall heights to an elevation ranging from 10.5 to 11.0 NAVD 88. Uh, second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Terrific, Bill, thank you for um, coming back tonight and for uh, continuing to push ahead. I know we're gonna potentially talk about maybe some Warren article, Warren article business related and, and I will be presenting to the advisory committee next week similar to the presentation that you've had terrific. just so that that whole group is well aware yeah. of the direction we're headed you know I was thinking um, after the presentation that um, both both the Harbor Development Committee and the Country Club um, you both have big projects that have a lot of moving parts and what's really helpful is when you kind of come into us with enough new news for an update 
and kind of give us a little bit of information just to keep us updated and, and then keep moving. And I'd encourage us to keep doing that because I think it, 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 makes, it makes it easier for everybody. Happy to do that anytime. Yeah. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Um, so the next couple items we have really relate to a lot of financial activities. So I'm, I'm going to invite Sue Nickerson to come up to the table. And Tom and Sue, I know there are three items. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you at how you would like to sequence those. So the first group I think we'd like to bring up is the Audit Committee. And they're going to do a presentation of the financial reports. And I'd like to introduce the chair of the Audit Committee, Michael Dwyer, and the partner at Powers & Sullivan, the head auditor, is Michael Nelligan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Do I need to introduce myself? Mike Dwyer, chair of the Audit Committee. And Michael, Michael Nelligan from Powers and Sullivan. Welcome. So we've got three, we've got a couple different sets of documents, so I might ask you to kind of walk us through what we have in front of us, if you could, please. Sure. Um, there are th three primary documents here. This is the comprehensive annual financial report, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, rolls over year to year with improvements and perfections for new government accounting standards boards requirements and such and the other two are the management letter including some responses from management to any kind of findings and finally a uh, report on federal awards anything over i understand it's five hundred thousand dollars okay of awards which we have so each of these things are required components mm -hmm. anything to add michael nope. So I would just, Tom, and maybe you could put the CAFR, I don't know if you want to put my copy up on the, just for the uh, audience to see. The CAFR is, um, I've had a chance to start looking through it. It is um, a document that we rely on so much during the year, um, whether it's the demographics or the statistical information um, and I think what it what it also illustrates is why Hingham is a AAA rated community. Um, and I would note for the audience that the CAFR is and previous year's CAFRs are available online and can be downloaded. So if people are interested in that, it really does contain a wealth of information. And um, I know all three of you were so intimately involved in preparing it. And we, we can't thank you enough for um, what a wonderful job it is. Truth be told, they do the heavy lifting. The committee meets and, you know, does, does a read and some edits, but uh, it, I think it's fine work. Yeah. You have a very brief report here I draw your yes. attention to. Um, page one simply says, in writing, you know, who's the players? Names out the committee, one of the members here tonight, Joshua Marine. Um, and most importantly, are that the findings, there's no there's nothing material, there's nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Each kind of thing, the, the language has changed this year from unqualified to unmodified, our CPAs on the committee tell us, but it's the same best you can have finding. So please, unless there's questions on page one, let's just turn to some small business items on page, on page two. Page one. Okay. Right, great, thanks. Um, you sent us great people. Um, we have a full five-person committee now, two of them CPAs, uh, financial professional, senior business person, so we're in great shape. Thank you. Um, George Danis did a great, Danis as a chairman, great job, and now we're lucky enough to have him as our advisor. Relay. Terrific. So that works, too. A few small things to, um, you know, findings or things. I, I believe you're aware we've published an RFP. Yes. We had results come back, four firms responded, including Powers and Sullivan. We received those on the 14th. We're um, evaluating them and scoring them, and we'll be opening price information late this month or early next. And just for the benefit of the, of the audience, um, the town typically from time to time where we engage outside professional services organizations, um, every, every five or so years we conduct an RFP just to, just to sort of see where things are. 
and um, uh, we do that for workers comp we do it so we do it for other things too um, and property. properties so um, that's just kind of part of our standard process um, we've been very pleased with the work that powers and Sullivan has done for the town uh, since we've partnered with you all right two other things we want to uh, touch on please uh, item four um, one of the things in our charter is that if if we should see or care to make a recommendation there's an invitation to discuss scope and anything that should be audited we want to avail ourselves it seems that Shrek would be a good entity to have audited I've been corrected by the financial professionals they're not a component of ours but we do rely on the seaworthiness of the transactions and Correct. documentation that support so I can speak to that briefly I am uh, a sitting member of the advisor or the executive board for Shrek um, I have raised this issue and with the executive board and it will be discussed at the next meeting yeah I mean Shrek <coughs> is our, our dispatch services I, I think it's it's about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year okay over eight over eight now this year so you know that is a material an, enough amount of a charge that we get that um, that makes sense all right, thanks a couple items. Let me offer my gray hair to say things are really well run here, okay? Um, typically, things get fixed as they're published. That's the case here, but this time the dollar amounts are a little bigger and the duration a little longer. But just let's touch on these quickly. Part of the audit process that um, Sue and Michael brought to us were, was a lacking in documentation for the fact that um, reimbursement requests had not been made for some grants that will eventually flow back from Shrek to Hingham. Okay. okay, there's some serious energy on the part of Sue and the executive director of Shrek that is quickly coming into catch up mode. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have now been reimbursed. Yes. Fair to say? Yes. Final item, um, and I've done federal and state grants myself, in a multi million dollar build out, it might seem odd but you can lose a hundred and fifty thousand dollar check it was made out to Shrek it was deposited to them but it's ours so as I understand it a repayment plan has been worked out and will be formalized it's we're going to be working with the, the board and we should have a, an agreement in place very shortly okay so I'll be again I'll be bringing that to the board at the next uh, meeting um, it's unclear to me the extent to which they're read in Okay. quite frankly so I need, I'm going to be discussing this with them um, we have what we believe is a fair uh, plan at attempting to resolve this and we'll be proposing that to the larger board at uh, the Shrek executive board again at the next meeting okay. um, but I can't speak for what that board will sure. do but I can speak to what I'll be presenting to them okay thank you so it's important to me not in any way to be alarmist I mean mm -hmm. but on the other hand it is our duty and Certainly. should this you know, a payment take time to work out or something would be remiss in not bringing it to your attention. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or commentary from the professionals here? I would just like to thank the audit committee and Powers and Sullivan for another great year. Um, it was it was great working with everybody. And we very much appreciate the, having the town of Hingham as a client. We, we find everybody in town to, to be very engaged in the process, and we really appreciate that that go between between the auditors and, the, and management. So thank you, and and likewise, we we hear very good things about the working relationship with Powers and Sullivan, and um, we appreciate that. I think. Um, uh, there's a lot of activity the size and complexity of this town the preparation and the auditing of all the financial statements is a pretty significant body of work that takes quite a long time and um, the the quality of that work is um, is is very high and very much appreciated um, and uh, uh, Mike I would also mention that that um, this year and and uh, both the selectmen and the moderator have appointing authority for the audit committee and uh, we had an unusually large number of people uh, very qualified people applying for the audit committee and we we could have probably staffed uh, four or five more can we had wonderful candidates and um, uh, so that was that was really good to see well it's great to hear and uh, thank you for um, I say we're well staffed 
final point, I don't recommend anything, but the last sentence in the charter says that we're meant to look at it annually. And so I just offer you, it seems like it covers what we need. It does have the scope to make a recommendation around additional audit scope or activity. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to raise my hand and say, should there be something you'd wish to consider, we're asked to do so on an annual basis. Thank you. So I would recommend that, um, given that that Sue and I uh, discuss this this uh, charter, perhaps I can go to one of their meetings mm -hmm. and talk with them about it and see if they have any recommendations and bring it to your attention at a meeting. What, one thing that I I think I brought it up maybe two years ago, and I you know I'm sure there are other things, but. Um, I know from my advisory days, we have, we have a number of revolving funds in different places, in different departments of the town. And um, one of the, you know, I, I know there are a lot of requirements for that, a lot of restrictions. And, and some of those revolving funds, actually, there's a lot of money that goes through them. And, um, and then there's also sometimes a question of, you know, when the money is collected in the revolving fund, how quickly is it applied? And you know, I, I think about it in terms of a turnover ratio, how quickly things turn over. And, um, and, and I know we, we have the same thing with some stabilization funds. And I just wondered, you know, that, that's one that I might ask you to think about because um, we have a number of those funds and some of them have a lot of dollars attached to them. So. Could you tip here a little more? Are, are you looking for greater clarity, would you say, or a more layman's explanation for, for the non-professionals like me? You know, I think what it is, Mike, is as, as we have a lot of these revolving funds, you have a lot of, you know, you have staff and you have volunteers who are, you know, we, we collect the money and then, you know, we apply it during the year. And you don't necessarily want to deplete your revolving fund because, you know, it's, it's providing for some services. Um, but by the same token, some of our stabilization and revolving funds, when, you know, when they come in our budget book or we have a town meeting warrant article, they have some large amounts in them. And, and so as I think about it, I think you know, as, as a taxpayer, if, I'm, if some of my money is going into a revolving fund or a stabilization fund, it should be going to work for me within a certain amount of time. You know, the idea is that, you know, it, which is it's like and inventory turns you're like saying. inventory turns and okay. and I just wonder from an audit perspective whether it might be helpful a helpful guidepost to those of us who are working with those funds as far as you know what's a good target or are we uh, are they are they turning the way they should um, so it, it's just one thing as as I look at you know areas of operation um, that might 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 be worthy of consideration tom and sue i'd i'd ask you to consider that but you may have other areas that in your mind uh would would rise to the top of the list sure yeah, we, we can add that for next yep. Year's yep. Audit plan. Sure. Yeah. anything else no just thank you very much for your hard work thank you. okay. thanks for your time uh, thank you oh thank you sue um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the financial statement and management letter as submitted, and I'm going to amend the motion um, with thanks to the um, audit committee and staff for and uh, and uh, auditors for their for their work on it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank okay. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Tom, what's next? So next, we can bring up. Um, uh, <clears throat> Linda Bourneval. Mm -hmm. From KMS actually. She's going to talk OPEP. Do you want to OPEP actuary evaluation? Oh, yeah. Paul knows I love the Paul knows I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it. Have so, <laughs> so just as, as a way of context and Linda Linda was here last year. Yes. Um, you know, our OPEB, our other post-employment benefits, which is retiree health care, um, it's a big number. Hingham was, I think we were the first community in the Commonwealth to start actively funding our OPEB obligation. Uh, we started doing that uh, close to 10 years ago. And um, based on some external and internal changes, we thought it would be helpful for Linda to come and give us an update. We as a board are going to need to make a decision in January 
about how much to budget in the forecast for OPEB. We have an amount in there, but we thought that it would be a good idea to get Linda's read on how things have settled out in the last year, realizing that there still may be some things that are going to still settle out. So welcome, Linda. All right. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Linda Borneville. Uh, from KMS Actuaries. I am a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. I'm an enrolled actuary, so I hope I have enough letters after my name to make all this stuff um, credible. So, um, as Madam Chair mentioned, we have updated some information from the last time we were here. We have uh, generally done a valuation, we call it a full valuation of these liabilities every other year. Um, there's been some new changes with some GASB accounting requirements. There have been some changes to the benefits offered themselves. So kind of want to walk through all of those things that have happened. I did put together a presentation. But I'm going to just fly right through my intro because I just did it. Um, and just talk a little about what is what are the OPEB accounting standards. There are, you know, something to keep in mind is to, is to sort of separate the concept of the accounting standards from the funding of the liabilities. Those are two really um, distinct um, points and I'll, I'll clarify as I go along. So OPEB accounting, really OPEB, it's other post-employment benefits. Just the other really just means it's anything but retirement benefits. The traditional defined benefit pension plan where your teachers are members of Mass Teachers Retirement System, your non-teacher employees are members of the Hingham Retirement System. Those are pensions segregated in their own set of standards and their own funding schedules. These are everything else, and it's health insurance, dental if it's offered, life insurance, those kinds of things. Um, again, the GASB has their standards for financial statement reporting. They do not have um, say or any jurisdiction over how to pre-fund these benefits. That really is a local um, policy issue. And even with all of the GASB changes that have um, come into play over these last couple of years and next year, or the year we're in actually, um, that still holds true, that GASB doesn't really meddle in the funding part of it. Nor is there any Massachusetts statute that requires pre-funding of these benefits. Now when we talk about funding of an OPEB benefit, the town actually does fund in a way um, even, even towns who aren't setting aside additional monies, they are paying a portion of, of retirees' health insurance. So there's kind of two components of the funding. There's this paying for a portion of the premium, and then there might be additional funds set aside in a trust to accumulate so that you can, in some future period of time, use those monies to pay these benefits. Okay, so again, retirement, they have a lot of um, statutes that require funding and need to be funded under certain methods and provisions and need to have a funded by date of 2040. Nothing like that is um, in place at this moment, I always have to clarify, um, regarding funding. Okay. And I would just add that one of the reasons the town has been funding OPEB is that in 2008-2009, you know, we are a pay-as-you-go system, so we right now are paying retiree health care benefits. As we looked out into the future, we realized that if we didn't start setting money aside, retiree health care benefits could equate to almost a quarter of our operating budget, you know, down the road. So we, there were many compelling reasons to do that. It also starts with our feeling, as you said, while there aren't any legal requirements, we believe we have a moral and ethical obligation to be able to pay the retiree health care benefits that we commit to people when they come to work for the town of Hingham. Good point, thank you. Um, continuing with the um, presentation, there are a few standards that we follow in terms of how we do our work. Um, the GASB, obviously, they list standards. Um, statements, the, st the standards that apply to OPEB are uh, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, GASB for short. Um, GASB statements 43 and 45 are kind of going away right now and they are being replaced by GASB 74 and 75. So those are the, the standards in which we're following. Generally accepted accounting principles. We have to provide information that's going to be used in the town's financial statements. Um, the auditors weigh in on some of the information that we're presenting. 
Um, they're auditing the data that's pre pre prepared by the town and submitted to us. So there's kind of a lot of hands in all of this stuff uh, to make sure that what we're providing is complete and accurate. Um, I am a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. We have what's called actuarial standards of practice that we must follow in terms of how we do this work. And there's all kinds of guidelines on um, accounting, you know, how do we pick assumptions, how do we pick demographic assumptions, or how do we actually value these kinds of benefits. So there's a lot of um, sort of oversight within the work that we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, there's been a bunch of, there have been a bunch of standard changes. Any entity that has an OPEB trust, which they have set aside monies into this trust for the purpose of pre-funding these benefits, there is a standard for um, those entities or for the plan that became effective FY17. So the, the CAFR probably has information that we just prepared on um, under GASB 74. And if not in this CAFR, it definitely will be in the FY17 financial statements. Um, starting in FY18, there will be another new standard put into place affected by OPEB, and that's um, the expense that the entity or the town is going to put on their on their income statement this has to be done under a different set of um, assumptions and also the biggest change is that the complete unfunded liability as of that day June 30th of 18 will actually appear on the balance sheet that's a little bit of a change from uh, the way it used to be so the idea of pre-funding this liability can become a very important one if you are looking um, just purely from a financial statement standpoint. Um, the larger that liability, obviously, you know, that will probably put a lot of communities in the red at this point. But as pre-funding happens, um, those liabilities can come down and they can actually, there can be a plan in place to actually completely eliminate those unfunded liabilities. Okay, put the glasses on now so we can read here. Okay, so I'm kind of ta I'll talk a little bit about the new standard and how we're going to do all this stuff. Um, again, most of most of the information that I'm kind of summarizing here is all in our most recent report, uh, which was published early December, um, including these June 30, 17 OPEB. Uh, disclosures under GASB 74. The real big change under the new standard is the way we have to calculate the discount rate. The discount rate is that return on money. Wait, we put our money in the in the bank. We hope it returns some, you know, some something positive in terms of investment return, and we're going to apply that same discount rate to all of our future benefits to calculate this liability. So the question is, how do we discount benefits way out into the future to the present? And that's the discount rate. And Gatsby says, if you have no money in the bank, basically you're paying pay as you go, you're going to look at, uh, generally they used to look at a, the rate of return on cash or something like that. What's in your general fund? That's how you're funding it, so that's what we're going to look at. Now they're saying to use a high quality municipal bond rate. And right now that's, that's running right around 3.5%. So to discount liabilities at 3.5% is pretty significant. That's a pretty low discount rate. Um, but the GASB also says, well, let's look at the money you have now set aside. Do you have enough money in the bank today to fund one year of benefit payments? If you do, you can discount that first year of benefit payments at your investment return rate. And we're using seven and three quarters. Then we're going to look at next year, and we're going to keep doing that out into the future for about 100 years until the last member dies. And we're going to try to project whether there will always be sufficient assets in the trust to fund all the benefits. And for Hingham, the answer is yes. There is always projected to be, based on this valuation, enough money that's sufficient to discount every benefit payment for all current members. Okay, so we get to use for all the projection a seven and three quarter long term rate of return. That's significant. There's not many communities that can do that. And it's based on two things. One, how much money to today is in the trust. And the second thing is what is the commitment toward future funding into that trust? 
because you could say you have $12 million in the bank, but if you don't put another dollar in, you're probably going to run out of money pretty quickly. But if there is a policy commitment to, um, and it can be an informal commitment or formal, if there is a commitment and um, we can use that in the model and we can predict that or project that the assets will be sufficient, then we get to use that long-term rate of return. So that's a huge change um, from the current standards, which were a little kind of looser on, on how you were, really was based on, you know, are you fully funding the ARC? That's the, the buzzword. And if you were, you got to use the long-term rate. Um, this one really talks more about money in the trust and then a future commitment toward it. So it really looks at a long-term outlook of what is, what is there right now. So every other year we perform a full actuarial valuation where we collect all the member census data from the town. That includes all the active employees who will become future retirees at some point, possibly, and all your current retirees who are covered under either a life insurance policy or health insurance. Um, the town has an obligation to fund a portion of all of those retirees and future retirees premiums so they generate a liability to the town. It's not just the dollars that are spent in fiscal 18 that we're talking about. We're talking about trying to project every single year into the future for every person who's a current retiree and the future retirees up until that time 100 years from now when the last person dies what we think those payments are going to be based on the current premiums of the program you offer, the cost sharing arrangement, who's paying what percentage between town and retiree, what percentage is paid by the town on the full premium, what percent's paid by the retiree, um, whether, you know, or how long all those people are going to live, whether they're even going to retire or not, they could terminate employment. So there's a lot of factors that go into the model. We choose all of those assumptions based on not just plucking them out of the air, but there are some methods. Uh, we look to the retirement systems actuarial valuations for things like when do we think teachers are going to retire. Well, all of that work has kind of already been done by the state teachers retirement system. So we look to some of those assumptions. We look to the Hingham retirement system. We have studies in terms of how we think premiums are going to increase into the future. So there's a lot of assumptions, and those are all um, very, um, I would say, you know, there's a lot of detail on all the assumptions that are used. There's about seven pages of assumptions that are included in our evaluation reports that go into all the detail of, of, the, uh, of the information that we use. Um, with that, we develop liabilities, and that could be any, any a liability for very many purposes. It can be for the financial statement disclosures. It could be for developing a funding policy to fund off that, you know, to, to, to pre-fund and reduce that unfunded liability. So we take the, the liabilities calculated and then kind of use our calculator to develop whether it be the GASB standard OPEB expense or the disclosures or a funding policy. My presentation continues with just some information on census data. It's like who, is, who are the people that we include in this? As I mentioned, it's current retirees who are covered under any of these programs, and also all your current employees. Um, generally, they are the same people who are either in the Hingham retirement system, and so these are really full-time employees or um, teachers in mass teachers retirement system. So those are the potentially eligible because they're not yet there yet, they're not retired, but we need to make assumptions as to the future and whether or not they will ultimately retire and be a part of, of the program in which benefits are being paid. Um, as I mentioned before, there's different plans that are offered. Um, the town just elected to move the employees, both active employees and retirees, to the Group Insurance Commission. Um, they are the group in Massachusetts that um, also um, insures all of the state employees 
state, all the of many of the teachers within Massachusetts are also on the GIC. Um, so communities have the option to purchase their insurance through the GIC and Hingham took advantage of that opportunity. There are two sets of plans, if you will. There's what we call the pre-Medicare or some people call them the active plans. Those are for any active employees and retirees who are not yet eligible for Medicare, uh, mostly due to the fact that they're not 65 yet. And then there's another group of plans, uh, Medicare supplemental plans that kind of um, work in coordination with Medicare, where Medicare is primary payer. These other plans, they're less expensive than the active plans because Medicare is primary and picking up much of the cost. So we take into account all of those plans and the elections by all the retirees. We try to guess what you know, future retirees are going to elect. The town and these retirees and future retirees cost share the premium. So you've got ranging between 10 and 50% that the retirees contribute um, and the town subsidizing the remainder. Town employees slash, or I should say town retirees are the 50% contributors, whereas some of the teachers range between 10 and 50, depending on um, their service at a particular point in time. There's also the modest life insurance coverage that all these retirees are covered under. And again, uh, mentioned that the GIC change, um, the premiums for currently for those plans were um, quite a bit lower than the plans the town was currently on. Running these new premiums through our model um, actually reduced our liabilities by about $7 million. And that's a, a, on a, about, about a $70, $72 million starting point. Um, there's sort of an annual contribution that we calculate every year if the town were to fully fund this ARC. Um, and with that GIC change, we're looking at about a $600,000 reduction in the annual ARC um, starting in FY18. Linda, do you remember what the, um, when you say it's decreasing by 600, from how much to how much? Do we have those I numbers with us? 2.9 to 2.3. Yeah, I, I've got the grand total arc, yep. but I can. 2.9 to 2.3, yeah. approximately. And, okay. and, and, and that's Linda the OPEB trust you. contribution, right? Because yeah. the arc is more like in the 5 right. million, 5.9 million range. And again, when we're talking contributions, it's pieces that go to the trust plus the piece that goes to our premium payments to begin with. So, so the two point so the two point three is both is is the sum of both the <coughs> contributory no, that's and the just OPEP? to the trust, I believe. Just to the trust. Okay, just that's to the, the trust. Annual yeah. funding of the trust. That is something that we have we had we've just I'm saying just literally, like yeah. in the last three days, <laughs> have just um, kind of looked at this GIC change. We still have some fine tuning to the sure. model to do that we want to check, and we'll be able to work with Tom and Sue on um, coming up with, I think, you know, a, a variety of scenarios if that's what they want on different funding policies. You know, there's a whole lot of ways to pay off the mortgage, right? You can funded over X many years or X plus 10 or whatever, you know, we choose and we can look at a bunch of models that can kind of help us hone in on, on something that can be acceptable by the town sure. in terms of paying off this unfunded. There's a lot of goals that can be set um, and you're not going to get there this year. You know, it's a, it's a long-term commitment. It's a long-term, you know, we're looking at this again over 100 years just with the current group that we have in place. There's always new people coming in and people retiring and leaving, um, but we can work on that and getting. So that, that $600,000 number, it's a, it's a little loose, but it, I think it's a pretty good number in terms of the GIC change. We've got other things going on, um, experience, experience between the last time we did this valuation and, yeah. and now is always gonna happen, you know, more people may have died than we thought, or more people left, or people younger are coming in, so those people generally are a little okay. less expensive. Okay. okay. So that's the GIC story. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of assumptions that we need to look at. Discount rate, already talked about the health care cost trend rates. How do we think premiums are going to increase in the future? Um, Studies show, I mean, generally in, in, in the actuarial community, you'll see things, you know, seven or eight percent currently. 
they'll decrease, <clears throat> the increases will decrease over the next few years and we come to an ultimate rate of somewhere like four and a half to five percent. Anything greater than that, studies have shown that healthcare, if there's any more than five, five and a half percent ultimate rates, that um, healthcare would actually take over the GDP in the future. So the studies kind of taper down those rates, not to say that we think they're all gonna, you know, for every year in the future, healthcare, health premiums will go up by 5%, but it's a good um, kind of, I think, a, a, a pretty conservative assumption to put into the model. Um, and as you know, you know, we don't know what year one increases are going to be. That's, that's, that is the danger of this very volatile benefit we don't really know how healthcare, you know, there's a lot of unknowns about healthcare. Certainly. And so a 7% year one, you know, a year ago, I think we had a 15% increase. So that created some significant losses in our model that that's why we do it every other year because we're trying to refine some of the knowns that were unknown two years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Um, again, we have a lot of demographic assumptions regarding retirement, disability, turnover, um, and those all depend on the employee type. There's three types of employees in pretty much every OPEB model. There are teachers, there are the other general employees, and then you have your public safety, police, and fire. Um, the most significant difference between those three are the differences between the incidence of retirement for your police and fire compared to your general, general employees. Um, because under the retirement system in Massachusetts, they can retire a bit earlier than um, general employees. In retirement, though, um, you have, if you, if, just like Social Security, if you understand that, is if you retire earlier, your benefits lower. So generally, they're about equal in value at the end of the day. In the OPEB world, that is not the case. The premium is the premium. Whether you retire at 48, 58, or 64, everybody would, if they're all in the same plan, they're all paying the same premium. So an early retirement tends to be very expensive compared to um, in a retirement system world where earlier is reduced so the values become kind of equal. Mm -hmm. you, they're usually reduced actuarially equivalent is what we call it. But in OPEB you won't see that because it's flat rates. And when you turn 65, you know, again, somebody retiring at 65 versus 75 is pretty significant because you got 10 more years of payments and the payments are the same. Everybody wants to control OPEB costs and liabilities. There is a difference. The cost is what you're paying. It's the GIC. It's what you offer. It's how you cost share. You know, that, that's sort of the plan provision. It's your, it's your plans. Um, again, moving to the GIC currently, it, it's a very you know, positive move in terms of savings. I think Sue mentioned to me that um, just in year one budget is about $600,000 difference in the premiums between actives and, or between, all, these are all including all the actives as well. Um, that is a method of controlling costs. Um, pension reform a few, came in a few years ago where um, anyone who was hired after April 2nd of 2012 had different retirement provisions under the retirement systems. They had to wait a few more years to retire for this group. So you'll hear people talk about the tier one or tier two groups of retirees. If, um, as you can probably figure out, there's not many of those people who are ready to retire yet. They don't even have 10 years. Um, they barely have, let's see, five years. So those kind of changes on pension reform especially, um, when you put legislation in like that, that only impacts future hires, does nothing to liabilities. But as we move through and more years, you know, that we're further and further away from this April 2nd, April of 2012 date, there'll be more and more people impacted in terms of computing the liabilities. And at some point, um, those 55 year olds who might have retired now need to wait to their 60 in order to get a, a retirement benefit. You have about 40% of your, it's, it's amazing how fast that happens. Just in that period of time, oh, about 40% of your active employees are these tier two employees already. In the first year, there was like, you know, 10, 10 employees. And now, as we're, you know, five years into it, um, it's just attrition, you know, people leaving and hiring new people. If you don't hire somebody who is already in a mass system, 
prior to April 1 of 2012, they will start under the new rules. Okay, so those are good cost saving for OPEB for the same reason that I mentioned that if you delay retirement in OPEB, it really does matter. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pre-funding to the OPEB trust is a way to control your liability, right? Because you're not doing, by pre-funding, you're really not doing anything to the benefits that you're offering, but you are reducing your liability. You have about $12 million in the trust at June, it's at June 30th when we did the last valuation. Mm -hmm. That includes uh, monies um, invested by both the town and the light department combined. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the assets are projected to be available to make all future benefit payments. So kudos to um, the policy for future funding and money that's there now. You get to use the long-term rate of return Great. in discounting. And the rule, by the way, is higher discount rate means lower liabilities. Seems counterintuitive, but that's what you're you're kind of hoping for is, is the use of a higher investment return rate. Um, so with that, thank you. take any, any questions. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very helpful. We appreciate your coming back because a year ago we said there were going to be a lot of changes. And last year I think we said we're going to wait and see how those changes sort of materialize. And, and I realized that some of them are still settling in and there are sort of new developments, but um, this is very helpful. And as, as we're moving forward in our budget process, and we're going to start our budget hearings for the night in a couple of minutes, um, we're, we're interested in a point of view on, you know, our OPEB funding. We're, we're still kind of on the old schedule. And I think the question is for this upcoming year, do we stay on the old schedule or do we start to move to a new schedule? Is there, have things stabilized enough? So. You know, we, we appreciate this information, and I know that, you know, you'll be working with Sue and Tom over the next several weeks to help us develop a point of view on that. It's really helpful that you come in now because as we get into January, the numbers start to get tighter. So to the extent that we want to modify something in the budget, the sooner and the earlier we flag that, um, the better it is. So appreciate, you know, Everybody's uh, appreciate you making the effort and coming here tonight to share this with us. Yeah, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah, you're good. Thank you very much. Sue, so we have one more thing with you. I have several more things with me. Oh, oh yes, before the budget. Yep. Before the budget, Sue's going to present the fund balance memo. Thank you, Gilda. <laughs> Okay. Um, before you, you have FY17's fund balance memo. Uh, total general fund balance for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2017 is $32,561,028. As compared to the fund balance from last year, fiscal 16, of 31,503,190, which represents an increase of 1,057,838. Total annual expenditures for FY17 was 103,021,275. The percent of unfund, unassigned fund balance to total annual expenditures is 22.31%. Our fiscal policy is 16 to 20. Um, the next chart just shows you the components of fund balance, mm -hmm. uh, restricted at $1.25 million. That was from the sale of the Hersey House. Committed of $5.8 million. That's the two stabilization funds, mooring permits, special articles, and Article 16 from 2016 Lincoln School Apartments because we have not used it, so we have to recommit it. Mm -hmm. um, assigned fund balance at about $2.5 million. Uh, 1.2 is encumbrances and 1.2 is subsequent years expenditures. Um, so our total unassigned fund balance is 22,981,179. The change in fund balance is attributed to three categories. Supl surplus of revenues of approximately $1.8 million, a budget surplus of approximately $1.4 million, minus the use of fund balance of $2.2 million. Second page 
it illustrates the two categories of surplus revenue and then uh, the surplus of budget. Uh, we had a surplus of um, a variance on general fund revenue of $1.8 million. Um, most of that was local receipts. And the top five categories for, for that were ambulance fees, license and permits, investment income, charges for service, and motor kill vehicle excise. Um, stop me if you have any questions. Uh, the turnbacks from all the budgets were uh, $1.4 million. Uh, the top one was employee benefits, and it was basically from group insurance of 443000 General government was surpluses from town hall, selectmen, IT, the reserve fund, community planning, legal, and all others. Education had a surplus of AA of 165,000, 89 was from FY16 encumbrances that they didn't expend. Debt service, the savings was from the refunding of older debt. Public works, DPW had a surplus of 42,000, landfill 58,000, and engineering 5,000. Human service, uh, the budget surplus was from vet veterans benefits of 64,000. Culture and rec, was from the library of almost 58,000. And all others, there was police, fire, and um, unclassified. I just want to remind everybody that uh, the above increases to fund balance are one-time occurrence and shouldn't be viewed as ongoing in future years. Um, the budget surpluses of 1.4 million is, um, it makes all the departments very fiscally responsible. Um, it's uh, like a 1% turn back for each department. The next page is basically just an Excel spreadsheet of um, what goes in and out of fund balance as of June 30th. That's helpful because things go in and out of the different categories. Yes. Yeah. Questions? Um, so the fact that I, I would just point out that our, our fund balance right now, our, the complete fund balance is uh, just under $33 million, and in fiscal year 2008, I think it was around eight or nine million dollars. And that's when the town was put on credit watch by all three rating agencies, and the big thing they said was that your fund balance, your rainy day fund, was not adequate. Uh, the advisory committee incorporated a uh, financial policy. We set a target for fund balance. Um, with, with the help of Sue and others, we made some policy changes at how we funded capital. Um, and we, we did a lot of good things that both allowed our fund balance to accumulate, and also we have wonderful department heads who are very responsible with their budgets. And um, I don't think any of us would have thought that 10 years ago we would be sitting where we are right now with such a healthy fund balance. And, I think that's a very good thing for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, to Sue's point, I would echo that, you know, we have a hundred million dollar budget. So at the end of the year, you know, it's not, it's not surprising that we may have some turnbacks. And in fact, if we're turning back a million dollars, that says our forecast accuracy is 99%. Um, I know a lot of baseball players that would like that, <laughs> that kind of a batting average. So. Um, I would also just point out that, you know, when our unassigned fund balance, which is the portion that is the rainy day fund, is above the limit set in the financial policy, and the financial policy also speaks to what do you do when that happens. And, you know, we haven't had a lot of time to talk about it, but knowing that there are a lot of big capital projects on the horizon, um, it, it strikes me that you know, having, having some excess in fund balance is a good thing. Um, we don't use fund balance to fund the operating budget. And I don't think we have any, any appetite for changing that policy. As Sue said, <coughs> these are often one-time funds. We can't count on them year to year. So we're not going to build a budget that relies on these or get overly aggressive with our revenue picture. Um, because when we've done that in the past, We've had an economic downturn, and that's been difficult. So um, 
Sue, could you make sure that this fund balance memo is put on the website? Yes, I can. I know this is something that the community is often interested in. Terrific. Mm. Um, thank you. You're welcome. So budgets, Tom? Sure. Okay. Our first guest. Guess who's that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be Sue Nickerson. <clears throat> She's trying to get through all of her, what, seven budgets, Sue? Okay. Can go next uh, prior to, to going into <laughs> advisory committee to do the same thing there. Yep. So uh, our first budget will be uh, Sue's budget, the accounting office. If you look on page six in your budget book, you'll see that her salary requests are increasing from 281 to 293, 281,000 to 293,000. Those are contractual obligations. Uh, for salaries and her expense accounts are level funded mm -hmm. questions Paul mm -hmm. and then the audit service is going I'm up. sorry yeah the audit service is yep. going up at thirty five hundred dollars yep when I think about all the accounting work and you know we we've seen a lot of the results tonight um, you and your team are really busy Yes, we and are. it's it's not only all of these statements, but it's all of the ongoing financial operations of this very large enterprise. Um, these dollars go a long way, and you and your team do a great job. Well, thank you. We do have a very good team. Okay, the next budget is the reserve fund. That is page five in your budget. The reserve fund is. Uh, an increase of thirty thousand dollars over last year, from five hundred and fifty thousand to five hundred and eighty thousand. This is the fund that is monitored and uh, maintained by the advisory committee to uh, to uh, um, fund unforeseen expenses during the year. And this is this increase is due to the financial policy and uh, in what its requirements. That's are. the three quarters of a percent. Yes. That's right. yes. Terrific. So we, for the benefit of the audience, we, uh, the financial policies within the town says that we will have a reserve fund that's equivalent to three quarters of a percent of the operating, operating expenses. And so that's that's what this is. Okay. Questions. Okay. Okay, if you jump way to the back of your book, page 141, I'm not going to make it easy on you. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk to the debt service. And this is the debt schedule, uh, the existing debt schedule, and it is dropping from 6500000 to 6293000 And is this... A um, principal. Is this um, excluded debt, included debt? Is this all debt? This is all principal. Yes, all, all, all principal yes. for included and excluded debt. Yes. Okay. Sue, so one if you thing. Look, um, sorry. You go ahead. Uh, Roman numeral 20 and 21, that, that's the 15 year debt schedule and um, FY 19s, and that does excluded, not okay. excluded. Sue, so I notice on page 141 that the first two items, um, which is uh, uh, town hall and, uh, um, South, and South School, that those the principal is dropping off yes pretty much because we're approaching the time when those are paid off yes, yeah okay so these are right off the death schedule okay um, and by the way these budgets I'm recommending the same as the re as the request as we go through these mm -hmm. Paula Karen mm -hmm. any other questions no no nope, I'm good okay Workers' Compensation, page 147. This is a level fund request from 330000 from last year to 330000 this year. And there's an additional request That's of right, 50 yeah, times? Workers' Compensation. There's an additional yes. request of like $50,000. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, which I also recommended. Okay. And that's kind of based on where we're trending and... It's basically, yes, the last... Since 2014, I've actually had to come here and ask for reserve fund yes. transfers at the end of the year. Um, so the claims, un unfortunately, are outweighing the appropriation. So I figured we could start building the fund balance back up again. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and so we've got kind of four years of history that would suggest. That's right. Yeah, we had a solid trend that, that justified that in my mind. Always a bit of a balancing act, right? It is. Yes, it is. That's right. Questions? Okay. Okay, next is unemployment, page 148. Again, this is a level funded request. Um, the total compensation is uh, recommended at one that thirty thousand, and I am also recommending thirty thousand. This What's is another balancing act. Some years we we spend more. We do pay dollar for dollar on unemployment, um, except for departments that are rate based. Rate like payers, the yeah. Country club, they pay us back. Yeah. Um, I mean, in seventeen, <laughs> in seventeen, we went ten thousand over. But um, right now, I think we will, we will be okay. Okay. And what's the consultant services for nineteen hundred dollars? What is that? That is our third party administrators. Okay. And they so they would administrate the the paying paying of the checks or the claims or what? Uh, they actually send all the stuff into the, the state, state and um, help us coincide with what who and what, and if we want to appeal, they help us go through that process. And that's a flat fee, so that doesn't matter, the yes. number, okay. Well done negotiating that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work for 1900 bucks. Exactly. Okay. Okay, next we have um, contributory retirement, page 146. The request here is coming up a little bit from 4221000 to 4502000 and this is straight off our um, actuary uh, valuation. Yeah. In my recommendation, and it's also same. we also we, um, in 2017 we did vote to um, increase the base from 12,000 yes. to 13,000. So this yep. is all reflected in there. Okay. Sue, so if uh, you may not have this number, but I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always interested in. What percentage of our of our you know contributory retirement are we funded? And um, this one was I think sixty nine percent. Yeah, you know just we as as that. a follow up, if we you could that. just we send that get, number, yeah. it's we can get that. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next we can uh, look to page one forty nine and see the Medicare costs. Our last year's budget was 852000 and this year we're recommending 885000 and I'm recommending same. And this is a mandatory tax of 1.45% of total salaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that takes account of any salary adjustments that are included in the budget? Well. <laughs> oh, we almost turned the page. Yeah. Um, all I could do is what salaries are in the budget. If it increases, I've put in a um, little bit of a cushion. Yes, a little okay. bit of a cushion. Okay. And we do pay um, police details. Um, we pay the 1.45 percent okay. Medicare on that. So that's also added in. So whatever we know, we've budgeted for. Yes. Okay. Okay. The next one is the the OPEB page and that is uh, page 145 this will take a little bit of an explanation so as we just heard from Ms. Bourneville the um, the Gatsby rules are changing a little bit the landscape and we in order to maintain our funding uh, schedule which had been laid out last in 2016 I yes. believe it recommended a funding and for 2019 of 2.9 million dollars um, that would be based against last year's funding funding uh, amount of 814,000 so that's in my opinion an untenable jump uh, we need to think this through a little bit and so what I'm recommending is that we take last year we look back at the 2014 schedule which is a schedule we had been working towards for the prior several years um, look towards the 2019 number available on the 2014 schedule which would have been eight hundred and eighty thousand dollars and I've taken that number and added to it two hundred and fifty thousand dollars recognizing that there is an increase as Gatsby is pointing out to us that's required for our funding schedule now one of the things we heard tonight from Linda was that 
um, we can look at a new funding schedule yes. and devise a new funding schedule for ourselves. Um, I think th th I have some ideas on how to go about doing that. Uh, we could speak and, and, and speak to that maybe at another meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if we can devise a new schedule that makes sense both within our budget constraints uh, and also gets us to where we all ethically want to be, I think uh, that's the best place to go as opposed to um, blindly funding to a prior schedule that, that clearly would, would, would cause significant um, heartache disruption yeah. disruption to the budget process. Yep. Yep. So my recommendation is $1.136 million up from $814,000. Mm -hmm. Tom, one of the things that um, might be interesting to do this year as well is to reach out to peers in other communities because I think all the, all the, all of, all the communities are wrestling with this change in GASB and the other pieces and um, it just might provide an additional point of view Absolutely. that could be helpful to us. A definite component of what we have to do, for sure. And I think to Linda's point, she talked about having a plan. Yes. yes. She talked about the importance of having a plan, and that's that's what I think we're talking about here. And I think what where we've seen in, in other places where we've needed to increase something for the budget, I mean, I, I see Randy in the audience, you know, snow and ice. You know, we're not going to get to the five-year average tomorrow, but what we might do is chip away at it over the next couple of years. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other things? No. Okay. We're done Sue and I, I know you're. Uh, yeah, we have group insurance. Okay. Oh, group insurance. Yeah. I'm sorry. Where's that? 145. Page 145. My page 145. Yeah. This is up uh, to 7.5 million dollars from from six points, um, eight six three million dollars from last year. And, and what we're doing is we, we, we just, yeah we're building in the 10 percent. Yeah. Um, the next few months, the GIC is going out to uh, bid new insurance plans, and the next couple of months we'll find out what, what they're planning on for next year's rates. Will they notify us sooner than the Mayflower Group? Um, since it's the first year, I don't know. Okay. Um, the one good thing is I didn't know if they've my, communicated any dates to us well, My yet. benefits coordinator. Um, used to work there so oh, that's we do have we have an in and we're waiting for her to use Great. those court those contacts so she will be going to the meetings and we'll try to um, find out a lot Great. sooner Great. Yeah. so this we're, is we're a, anticipating it, it is. that in January by the way yep. she might be able to get us something in January 10% seems prudent at this point short other information yes okay and the last budget is property and liability insurance okay. What page? You lost me off my off my count off my schedule. It's an unclassified. Uh, un, 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 unclassified. One fifty one. And this is a three percent increase. Uh, Richardson Insurance was ter insurance. was terrific. Um, <clears throat> they went to bat for us with their underwriters and guaranteed us um, a three percent increase. That's okay. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When, when was the last time we bid that contract? I think, it had, I think he said it had been three years. A couple years ago? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is that on like a five-year bid schedule? or? Um, we do it every once in a while. We don't do it on a, a, on, a, okay. on a consistent schedule. Okay. Seems like we're happy with them, though. Yes, we are. They've been with us for, I know it's longer than I've been here, so okay. I think it's like 25, 30 years. Okay. One thing I'll say to Richardson Insurance is they're um, – aside from their services that they're, they're incredibly responsive um, so when you have a question you have a need they're on it immediately well I was gonna say you know I I, I talked to them I think my colleagues talked to them a number of times on the dog leash yeah, right. stuff and we had pretty tight turnaround times for trying to understand you know the magnitude of the liability the process the hassle the cost all that stuff and and you're absolutely right Tom they they turned it right around so I really I have, really, I have I really been told there that. is not one day they don't do something for him <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, uh, Randy probably Randy probably can attest to that too <laughs> okay I am done so now. I know you're heading over to the advisory committee and I would just point out that in, a, in addition to all the the things that people have seen that you're involved with tonight you are also the liaison to the advisory committee, which means attending every advisory committee meeting, providing support, and um, know that this 
It's always a busy time for you, yes, but we is. are so grateful for all the great support that you provide to um, all the different departments, so thank you. Well, thank you, it's my pleasure. And were you the responsible for the CAFR that's on my desk now? Yes. Pretty <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> thank you. Well done. Thank you, Sue, great thank job. You. Okay, next I can invite Steve Becker, our Information Technology Director. So you want your pen? You have your own department now in the budget. That's right. <laughs> exactly. It could be good or bad. <laughs> it could be. So for years, IT had been in the accounting, um, in the accounting <coughs> budget. But last, last year, it was decided to pull it out for this year as its own budget. So given that, last year, um, Steve's budget was $175,000. For a salary, uh, it is moving contractually up to set one hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars, and his expense line item it was two hundred forty-three thousand dollars, and after uh, discussions, um, we decided, or uh, Steve decided that that should come down to two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. The main difference there is we are um, anticipating discontinuing a consultant service for social media programming, and the reason for this is. Uh, it's a $24,000 line item that in large part was geared towards building up the social media presence in town. Um, that in large part has been, has been done to the degree that it has been for several years. It hasn't changed much in several years. And talking to Steve, his, um, his department can fulfill those requirements to maintain mm -hmm. that presence at its current state um, and that uh, he can do that through his current staffing. Uh, we have discussed the selectman's goal of increasing our social media presence that was uh, discussed by, by you guys a few months ago and we recognize that and want to do that in an organized fashion in an organized way and again in discussions with steve we think that the the bandwidth to do that internally is available and um and would avoid this cost so Questions? i'm enjoying your Cybersecurity briefings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few people not happy with me. <laughs> I was just so glad I didn't click on that stuff. Oh. Uh, it's good. It's so important to do though, because I think it's every day the 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 stuff coming over the dashboard is um, frequent and um, sophisticated and uh, yeah. And I, I thought your explanation today was um, so. You, why don't you tell us? Uh, we received a uh, community compact grant uh, from the state uh, for $28,500 and that is going towards a cybersecurity assessment. Um, a little bit of training, uh, part of it, uh, network application uh, testing, uh, uh, network penetration testing. Uh, so the first phase was um, worked with MSI SAC which uh, works with all state, local, uh, tribal, territorial governments. Um, and they developed a phishing assessment plan uh, where we developed an email that kind of appeared to look like it was from information technology uh, from our department. Um, but it wasn't and had a link that went to um, one of their sites uh, where it asked you to put in your credentials, uh, your network credentials. Uh, and there were several aspects of the email that alerted you that it was not actually a legitimate email. Uh, and we gathered statistics as far as uh, who opened the emails, who clicked on the links, and who actually entered credentials. Um, granted, the statistics were very low as far as who clicked on the um, emails, but it only takes one person to really, uh, you know, cause havoc to a network. Uh, so it's an educational process. Uh, it's going to be an on edu ongoing educational process. And uh, but I, th I think we educate a few people <laughs> uh, to the dangers. Did you click on it? <laughs> <laughs> Would I have clicked on it? That's another story. It's a pretty. Pretty good, um, but I, I think that's great. Um, you know, the other, well, first of all, you know, onboarding a new selectman is not an easy process. You and Kate were both very patient with me. 
Um, and then, you know, I've had occasion in those last several months to, to work with some of the GIS data that you've um, developed, so useful in trying to analyze um, properties across town and planning. Um, you know, and last but not least, I'd be remiss in um, not complimenting you and Kate on all your work with respect to the, um, the off-leash dog walking program. That's been a really, uh, you know, last week Eileen was here and we complimented her and she quickly deflected the, the compliments to, um, to you and to Kate. So thank yep. you for that. I appreciate the kind words, but likewise, I'm <laughs> deflecting towards Kate. Uh, Kate did the majority of the work uh, developing that application and uh, she's been great through this whole process. Yeah. Good work. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, Thank Steve. You. Thank you very much. Okay, our next guest is Barbara Farnsworth from Elder Services. Page 80 in your books. <coughs> Get my own page. <laughs> <laughs> you have several pages. Okay, uh, Barbara's um, budget prep is. Uh, proposition or budget proposal excuse me was uh, up to 239,000 from 225,000 for salaries last uh, from last year and down from 19,000 to 18,000 this year so uh, the main increase in the salary line items are, are contractually based we had a reclassification of the outreach coordinator and uh, other than that I'll if you have any questions Barbara I'm sure I can speak to them you know, Barbara, when um, uh, Susan Sarney was in with the Board of Health and she talked a little bit about the work you're doing together and the proposal mm -hmm. for some hours for the social worker, and I was just interested in, in your point of view on that and how you see, how you would see that position supporting some of the work that you do. Right, I'm glad you raised that because I wanted to ask that that is something that gets supported in the Board of Health's um, budget. Um, I think a lot of the work we do together around some very difficult um, cases, some are hoarding, um, some are mental health issues that don't um, involve really good decision making. Um, and I think particularly for the under 60, um, we sometimes hit a wall. Um, there's not a lot of resources out there. Um, it's beyond the purview of where we can refer to. Um, and I think clinically um, in terms of, of some mental health that none of us are clinicians um, and and I think that would be a great asset to the town um, I think the towns who have hired social workers um, to work across the, the town both for 60 and older and under 60 um, have found that the the workload has grown exponentially um, I know situate started a couple of years ago at halftime and that quickly grew to full time um, and I can actually see that happening here so I would really hope that that's something that, that is supported. Thank you. And I'm always, um, you know, we, we have the benefit. You're always so nice to invite us to the volunteer appreciation luncheon. Are your volunteer hours, is it, is it the equivalent of like nine, ten people? Uh, five and a half. <laughs> okay, five and a half. You know, that's, I mean, basically, without that help, your budget would double. Your budget would double. And um, we're just so grateful to all the, all the volunteers. Um, yeah, and then I was just wondering, you know, in terms of, of programs and things that you're doing um, for, for next year, anything kind of new and different that, that you're focusing on? Um, we'll be spending a lot of the first half of actually 218 wrapping up accreditation. Um, it will be time to submit the manual, um, have the on-site visit, um, and really taking um, the self-assessment committee completed their work and met yesterday everybody did reports they came forth with some good recommendations um, one of the things the programming committee came forth with is that they're still looking at should we be doing some evening programming um, and, and for us that's a, a real staffing issue um, mm -hmm. and if we go forward doing that how do we ensure that there's staff in place to make that happen um, and I, I think that um, that's something that we're going to have to really look at in our long-range planning. Um, so I think that will be on the table for a look at next year, um, whether we'll move forward with actually being able to do that. Um, I'm not sure. 
Okay. And then you you were nice to take some time with with me a few weeks ago to to go through the center to talk about your programming to talk about the accreditation process and also some of the more global goals like um, like housing and transportation being um, two of the critical ones. So you know we have some van service mm -hmm. we have the ride but you know we we talked about um, as you know as the the cohort ages through Hingham, and as folks want to age in place, one of the questions is, what are some of the best practices that that we should look to in um, providing service to that to that? Cohort? I mean, I think one of the things I, I talked with Karen about was that I think we really, um, in, at some point in time, have to really take a look at can we develop some contracts with Uber or through another third party? Can we have Uber develop some contracts that we can? access through the um, to simplify the process for people who may not want to be downloading those apps on their phones and, and putting their credit cards on the phone um, you know I, we do an okay, a great job I think with the basics we can get people to and from medical appointments and grocery shopping and that but people's lives don't revolve around a, a nine to five day um, there's things in the evening things on weekends and um, I think to better serve the community those are some of the transportation things that we really need to look at and, and sort of that more on-demand almost um, on demand uh, on demand sort of transportation service right yeah right now it's you have to call a day ahead of time two days ahead of time to get a ride to go to the grocery store and you run out of milk on Wednesday you're gonna have to wait two days to go and that that really isn't um, a way to mm -hmm. live none of us do that right drive. Sure. right I think one of the other things we, we talked about and, and some of this is very space related um, depending on where the town hall study committee goes um, but one of the things that we've been doing some research on and looking at is, is the development of an early dementia day program for newly diagnosed um, so that we can um, begin to provide some support services um, for those people who um, are in the very, very beginning stages of, of dementia and or related um, Alzheimer's and um, can still function pretty independently in the home, but as they progress through the, the disease, need those supports and the ability to, to move through the system. Another thing I'd like to point out, it's not specifically related to the, um, to the Elder Services Department, but uh, as Barbara does with the, throughout the rest of this building, her, uh, her skills and she shares her skills and talents with everyone else. And at our, um, at our latest department head meeting last week, she graciously agreed to use that re uh, accreditation program and some of the documentation that, it, uh, that she created for that accreditation process and, um, and gave the rest of the department heads in town uh, a tutorial on, on succession planning. And um, and that's kind of, that's the kind of thing that's invaluable and and it's uh, it's it's synergies it's um, it builds a lot of rapport in town and everyone is very grateful for all the skills and everything that Barbara brings to the table. So, thank, thank you, Barbara. You. My mother-in-law enjoys these. Things, yeah. <laughs> we enjoy her. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, thank you so Thanks much. For thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, our next guest is Linda Harper, the Library Director, and David Mahegan, the uh, Chair of the Library Trustees, and, and Siegfried, member of the Library Trustees. I don't know if you have a chair. Pull the chair over. Thanks. The chair's on the side. <coughs> okay, if you go to page 96 in your budget book, and, and just before we get going, I wanted to introduce to those of you who don't know him, uh, Mr. Mayo and uh, members of the board, members of the public, our new treasurer, Jeremy, Trustee Jeremy Parker, who, uh, who has been taught the secret handshakes. <laughs> and he knows where all the gold doubloons have been buried, and uh, we have a great deal of confidence in his, uh, in his, when he's been thrown right into the, thrown right into the, into the scrum. So uh, he's a good man, and we're very, we're very glad to have him, very lucky to have him. So thank you, Is this your thank second you very year? much. Second year? Just it's just into the second year. Yep. Yeah, just Terrific. just starting the second year. That's Terrific. right. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so the library's budget has a salary line uh, up a little bit based on contractual obligations, up from 1.392 uh, million to 1.441 million. That is. Uh, some that is including inclusive of the contract that we negotiated um, with the trustees and Linda's help some 
four months ago, thereabouts. Pretty recently, huh? Yeah, yeah. So done in time to have inclusive in this budget and not in Article Four. So uh, that's an important distinction. So the expenses uh, budget is actually going down from three hundred thirty thousand to three hundred ten thousand, and I will let Linda speak to that. And I'm recommending same, by the way. Okay, and the um, the decrease in the um, expense, um, and a large part of that is due to a change in the um, formula for um, budgeting for electric. There was a decrease of um, 0 0.05 cents per kilowatt hour. So, you, based on our usage, we had a thirty thousand dollars savings right there. Um, we also had a savings in our furniture and equipment line. We just didn't need as much. Most of it is mis miscellaneous custodial items, tools, things like that. Um, just our needs are a little less this year. Um, those are the big sa cost savings in that category. Very good. Linda, I had a question about the books and periodicals, and I'm remembering back in my advisory days, there's always been a question of the, tr the, the sort of the trustees and the town have both kind of shared in the, um, the cost of books and periodicals, and what kind of jumped out to me was um, it's been it's been going up um, a little more than some of the other budget lines over the last couple of years. Yes. And I just wonder if you could refresh my memory sort of on how, you know, how are we doing that? Absolutely. Very good question. Well, one thing I do want to point out is most of the our materials um, budget comes from the trustees. The yes. trustees raise revenue, you know, from our annual fundraising drive, which is going on now, find revenue, um, state aid, principal and interest from the endowment. Um, so it, it looks like they're going to contribute about $215,000 towards the materials budget. Um, whereas the town is, is um, not quite to the same number there at this year at about 45000 So one thing I do want to point out is that the trustees do contribute yeah. a significant amount towards that. What we have to do is we're required to spend a certain amount on materials to Remain. qualify for state aid. Yeah. State aid gives us about $30,000 or so in every year, um, mm -hmm. depending on their budget, which is great. But it also qualifies us to apply for LSTA grants, things like that. So it's really important that we maintain those. And that's based on um, a formula that has to do with the total um, municipal appropriation, um, an increase over that, um, as well as hours that were open. So there's a formula, we plug it in, you know, to make state aid, we have to make that. So it does increase every year. Part of that is a, a two, I believe, a two and a half year increase um, for the past three years. So what you see is it, it does creep up. I know the state has been looking at that formula because we're all seeing increases every year. Um, so far, they have not changed it, but there has been some talk about looking to see if that needs to be tweaked so that, you know, kind of control those increases. And in, and in terms of purchases, does that include um, sort of website subscriptions and you know digital media as well so as this, an yes, audio this media? Yes, this includes books, um, movies, music, our digital, um, electronic, our e-books. So it's digital as well as physical materials. Okay. And how does the how does the Old Colony Library Network assessment figure into that as well? That's that's our price tag for being able to persis, participate in the network. In the network, yes. This year was capped at three percent. So right now we're in a transition year. We're we're reworking that formula as well. Um, our increase prior to that for Hingham looked a little higher than that. And so we worked um, with the network. We got a cap of three percent. We're transitioning to a different model, um, which hasn't been worked out for next year, but it, the costs are being at least controlled and people are aware of these, these increases hitting our budgets yep. and that we don't want to come back to the towns and say we have more than a 3% you know, increase. So, um, but that does enable us to participate in reciprocal lending with all the other networks. Um, if we did not participate in that, we wouldn't be able to borrow. People wouldn't get their holds in. They couldn't go to other libraries. Um, the other important thing is that also is a lot of the back end stuff that people don't see, which is the infrastructure, the whole system that we use. is an right. expensive system, uh, right. the servers, right. the maintenance for the server, the program that we use, uh, Circe Dynex is very expensive. Um, we share it with the network. So there's a lot of other costs involved. It's built into that 47 in, this absolutely. year. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And do we get any credit for being a net lender in that? There is, yes. In the new formula assessment, there is. 
um, a category that is a credit for that. What we're hope, what I'm hoping is in the reiteration of the formula, it's a little more heavily weighted because we are a, a pretty big net lender. That is being worked out on the network level. Okay. And um, Linda, on the salary line, um, in terms of, it assumes Sunday hours for all of the year except July and August? That is correct. Okay. So and then and then I know around um, midterms and finals, um, the library's open till 11 a couple nights, so that's that's in there as well? That's not in there, but we can usually cover it out of our okay. regular budget. It's yep. a couple nights, and we're all happy to show up to be there for everybody. So. I, think, um, I think the students enjoy it. I'm not, still not quite sure how much studying gets done. <laughs> Um, uh, they do. They, you yeah, know, yeah. They, they study, but they also, it's a, it's a chance to be somewhere where they can get some work done and, and say hello to some friends. Yeah, well, you know, that's Good part night. of pre preparing them for college. So. It sure is. Um, <coughs> terrific. Any questions? No, 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 no. Um, and, you know, you're always so good at numbers, but about a, th a thousand people come through the library every day? Yes. It's... Um, Funny, funny you should ask. I happen to have it right here. <laughs> so I, I, I would love money. to just throw, I, I'm going to brag a little bit. And because, you know, this is a lot of money to ask people to spend, but I want people to understand this is such an essential service to the town. We do so much. The library gets used like crazy. So we had last year 254,000 people, over 254,000 people come through the doors, which is an average over 1,000 people a day. We had 18,700 children and adults attend nearly 800 lectures and programs last year. And we also, our patrons borrowed over 334,000 items, books, movies, music, digital items last year. So when we're talking about materials budget, we're talking about, you know, the money for staff. This is why, because we're here for everybody. Yep. Thank you for asking. And I would also say that the, um, that the bookstore there which is also um, just a great, a great place. And um, I, I don't know if this was done in the past, but now you can get a charitable, you know, you can get a donation, so, uh, or a tax receipt, so donations are tax deductible. So they are. Um, that's a nice ad as well. It sure is. So anyone who wants to drop anything off will always write out a receipt for them. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Oh, that's it. No. Nope, great. Great work. Thank you for, and, and you know, to the trustees, it's um, uh, David and I caught up this morning for coffee, and you know, with a lot of the trustees, and in, in particular Ed and David, um, you know, the library trustees, it's it's a little different than when you you know you volunteer on a town committee and sort of six years and two terms and you're done, and with the trustees, especially those who are permanent. I think we're just so fortunate that we have the longevity and the commitment of so many citizens who are committed to the town and to the library and um, it just really is is so extraordinary and it, it just speaks to the great volunteerism in Hingham and it's it's a great example for everybody so thank you and again great job with the uh, collective bargaining agreement oh thank you very much thank you all thanks thanks for coming thank you everyone <coughs> Okay, next we have the Department of Public Works, Director Randy Sylvester. And that is on page 63. Hi, Randy. How you doing? Good, thanks. <clears throat> All right. We can start. Okay, we'll start with the uh, Department of Public Works schedule, uh, budget. Randy's salaries are increasing from 2,024,000 to 2,072,000. That is all contractual. These, uh, these numbers include the DPW supervisor's contract, as that was done again early enough. Uh, the DPW um, employees, or remaining employees uh, uh, contract is still con uh, continuing. Those negotiations are underway. So those will be covered in Article 4 of the, of the warrant. Okay, so going down to expenses, we're coming up a whopping $1,000 or so, from $438,950 to $440,275. And I will let Mr. Sylvester explain that expense. <laughs> <coughs> expenses? Uh, <coughs> it's the change. Well, the, the change, um, well, there's seven components, but yeah. 
Um, the reason it's maintaining itself is because the electric rates have come down and uh, some of the others have gone up, such as maintenance of grounds, maintenance of the building and whatnot. But it, it works out with each other and it's only a thousand dollar difference. So Randy's in, uh, total requested budget <coughs> was Total, total, total. Sorry, uh, three million four hundred twenty-five thousand nine hundred three dollars. That included um, uh, an additional request of one hundred forty-six thousand six hundred seventy-eight dollars. I am uh, forwarding to you a recommendation <coughs> of an additional request of fifty-two thousand two hundred twenty dollars, and that is intended to cover the cost of an additional labor that was removed from Randy's uh, ranks last year when he was asked to do so for budgeting purposes. Um, we wanted to try to put that back in this year uh, as it was at, at the time anticipated as a one year um, hiatus from that position from, from the budget. So I didn't want it to get lost. I recommended that we put it back in and, uh, and that he be made whole with his staff. That it does affect things like uh, overtime costs and um, you know, you know, big declining vacations and stuff like that that does get affected by these types of things. So I'm recommending that we replace that. But only to the 52, so you're only not recommending the, the assistant DPW superintendent? I am not, I am not, yeah, I think um, Randy and I have talked about this. I think that there are some, um, some, further, some further discussions that have to go into that conversation before, um, before, that, before the operation uh, would, we would need to really discuss that in more, in, uh, in more detail before it became a real uh, a request that I would support. Okay. All questions? No. I just, you know, again, I, I think people have heard it. I think the um, the effect of the utility rates, the, the change in the electrical rates, has really been a, a positive um, boon to the to the bottom line in town. So, shout out to Hingham Light Plant. It sure has. Yes. At the, at the same time, and Tom, I, I wondered if um, maybe we could ask Sue, and I apologize, I forgot, but if we could, I think it would be a, nice if we could just look on one page what the total effect of utilities are. I mean, I know there's a 14% water rate increase, there's an electric decrease, there's sewer, there's fuel. That's a good um, idea. Because one of the things that happens is that, you know, we, we may have those savings with Hingham Light this year. But we're not going to have them. We won't necessarily have that same reduction going into the future. And in particular, as we're looking at a lot of these budget requests, a lot of them are personnel driven. Right. And so we know those costs will escalate. So I think as we're in particular looking at adding personnel, funding it this year with savings from electric, I, I think we just want to kind of keep a little bit of a long term view so that we're not creating a structural deficit in any of our budgets. Agreed. I can do that. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other questions, we can move on to the next Randy's next budget, which is the landfill recycling budget on page 68. Okay. Randy's uh, request <coughs> requested budgets here are 544,000 up from 522,000 for salaries. Those are contractual obligated uh, increased increases. Again, supervisors are in there and, um, and rank and file employees are not. The expenses are coming down from 833,000 down to 832,000. And again, in large part due to the, uh, due to the electrical savings. Randy, where does the CMAS contract show up? What is this in the in the trash removal line? Okay, I just want to point <clears throat> out that that while it's kind of flat year over year, that in large part due to Randy's work, we negotiated a CMAS contract. If you look, um, there was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar reduction from fiscal year sixteen to seventeen. Um, so and slight bump up in recycling costs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, recycling costs are trending upward, um, and the reason for that is um, the policy from China. It's called National Sword, which China is not taking the recyclables that they once did. 
Um, what they are doing is they're relying on their own resources and what they have done is created um, a specification of recyclables um, that is very hard for people to meet. Okay. So the recycling industry is changing and it's an important part of it because for us to receive money back for our recyclables, we have to clean them up because that's what the specifications say. So we have to clean them? Or you have to say? Where that we start. Okay. The residents start by when, <clears throat> Hingham's lucky and we never went to a single stream. Not that single stream's a bad thing. But when you're in single stream. That was gonna be my next question. Yeah, yeah. single stream is, um, they're actually paying when single stream came about, they, per ton was about, you'd get $30 a ton. Yeah. Um, they, all the people who took them in could get rid of the, as a commodity. Now people are paying um, up to 30 and there's rumors of going up to $60 a ton for paying for those recyclables. Hingham's lucky that we never, we still separate. Um, we do get money for some of our recyclables. Um, there was pressures a while back to go to single stream. The theory being that single stream creates more recycling. Right. But what is it? What it has shown is that people put a lot more on desirable recyclables yeah. in. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. And I could give. You, I won't. But and that <clears throat> contaminates the recyclables and the uh, commodity. So Hingham separates glass, plastics, um, tin cans, whatnot. So we still get a little bit back our cardboard paper. Um, they're still valuable. We get market rate for uh, for our cardboard. We get a little bit for our paper, but we do um, we do have to pay shipping, which uh, is starting to cost. And the recyclables, that whole budget's going up. Okay. Another portion of this whole thing is. Um, is electronics. We used to get uh, <clears throat> the electronics when I first took over the transfer station. We would be able to get rid of a container at no cost. Now we're, we're spending a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a container, and that's for computers, uh, monitors, every type of electronic you can imagine, and uh, that whole industry is not changing so everything is everything in the recycling industry it used to be great because we used to get a tremendous amount of money Back, for it and yeah. revenue but now it's starting to cost us thank you for that yeah. how is the swap going the swaps going fabulously I, I saw that um, I saw an advertisement for a scheduler we did lose our uh, swap shop coordinator, and we, we are looking for a new one. Um, our office has taken over the scheduling. Um, it was posted today, as a matter of fact. Um, but everything is going according to plan. You know, I know there there's a lot of activity at the transfer station. It's a lot of moving parts, and um, I appreciate that you and your team understand that the swap shop holds a special place for a lot of people and you work hard to make it work for everybody. And I know that isn't always easy. And um, I would also be remiss if I didn't thank you in advance for um, supporting Troop One, who collects all the Christmas trees from Hingham and allowing all the trucks to come in and put uh, you know, 1,500 trees from Hingham residents at the transfer station. It really... Um, you let the kids go out there and hand out flyers and bring the trucks in and um, they really appreciate the the great partnership that they have with you absolutely thank you as long as the christmas trees are all clean <laughs> so we can recycle those also yep <clears throat> i'd like to compliment you on the um, fine job i think that you're doing in the dpw um, and i refer to it as the highway but um, I, I'm just very, very pleased with the, the face of the town. I think you guys keep keep the place looking great. 
Um, I'll, I'll add my two cents about the swap shop, too. <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Tom, did we, um, uh, did we touch on the snow removal? No, we didn't. No, we did not. OK, could we? Is, is this a good time to just sure. go back to that? I know we're going to talk about the sewer in a moment, but. <clears throat> sure. Also, the road, I think the road maintenance. It's uh, page 64, I think. Um, snow removal. Uh, I have not increased the budget. Yeah. Um, usually, this is, that's flat. The selectmen or the town administrator will put in. We've been mm -hmm. putting in around $25,000 a year. To get it up to our average, uh, five hundred and fifty-four thousand is not near our average. Right. Um, we'll probably go over that very soon. Just that we have to fill our salt shed. We did get very favorable results in our bids on that, but we do have a large salt shed now, which is which is fortunate. We do have to fill it, and that takes a good chunk of that money. Mm -hmm. Um, when we just began, so <clears throat> this is a good start, but depending on the weather. Yeah. I think we might want to, you know, Tom, we might want to look and say, you know, what's the five-year average, what's the 10-year average, and then look to say, you know, maybe it's over the next four or five years. What, what sort of a level do we want to get to? Um, I, I realize that, you know, I think every, Randy, a typical storm is about $100,000, I think. Yes. I mean, obviously, it depends on the amount of accumulation, but, yeah. It depends on the storm. Yep. And you've got the new sidewalk vehicle? Is it in? It is not in yet. Okay. We're working on that. Okay. Great. Um, and, then, uh, and then the road maintenance budget, and so this is, just to clarify where we have a road building budget, this is the, the maintenance of the road. So these are Correct. potholes and things Potholes, above fences. Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> potholes, fences, we crack seal. We basically do it all from this budget. We buy trees, maintain the trees. It all comes out of this budget. Um, the other part of it, and we were fortunate enough to get the $50,000 for the phase two stormwater. Um, and that's maintenance of all the catch basins. And since we don't have a landfill anymore, we are now having to pay for the, the debris removal that we collect out of our catch basins. Um, so that alone is another, I would say, forty to $50,000 a year. And there is more requirements coming up in the phase two stormwater in the new permit, which we will have to uh, adhere to. Questions, comments, yeah. Karen? Nope, else? I'm good. <clears throat> okay, for the next budget, maybe if, uh, no, okay. <laughs> we can go on to the sewer budget. That is on page 71. So the sewer budget, they are, uh, <clears throat> Randy's recommending an increase from 332,000 last year to 350,000 this year for salaries. Again, that is contractual and includes the supervisor's numbers and not the rank and file contract. <clears throat> Expenses are down from 285,000 to 273,000. I am recommending uh, Randy's, recommend, uh, Randy's requests. And then the, um MWRA. Yeah, the MWRA and the Hull uh, <coughs> intermunicipal yeah. agreements are uh, uh, the bulk of the total increases, and um, I'll let Randy speak to those increases and the reasons for those percentages. Right. Um, every year, we reach out to these to the MWRA. They're more responsible than the town of Hull for that intermunicipal agreement, um, but. They give us an approximate increase. I put it into the budget. I actually add a couple of percentage points. They said around five, I put in seven. Um, 
and that's how we arrive at those numbers. Um, so it's it's an estimate, best guess estimate. Uh, when I do this budget, the Hull Intermissible Agreement um, is a little bit different. They don't give us their numbers um, probably 60 days before town meeting. So this is our best, this is my best guesstimate, and I always try to, to estimate high because we did have a year where I estimated 18% and it was an actually a 27% increase. So <clears throat> I did 15% but I haven't got actual figures from them at this point. So this is my guess, best guesstimate at this point. It's almost, uh, that how, it's almost doubled in three years. <clears throat> yes. Um, and um, uh, Randy, has the sewer commission, uh, you know, this, this is actually a budget that it's, it's neutral to the taxpayers because this is all paid for through the rate through the rate payers. So while right. while this board while this board and town meeting votes on the sewer budget, the independently elected sewer commission, um, you know, it, then recoups this through through all, you know, the, the one third of residents that, that are on the sewer. <coughs> Has the sewer commission voted on this budget? They, they have. I presented it at their last meeting, and they uh, endorsed it Great. unanimously. Okay, thank you. Karen, any questions? What's the age of the uh, station down on Station Street? Station Street? Um, I am unsure. I think it was put in the uh, 70s, if not 60s. So we have the harbor development in, we've had them in about um, some of the plans for the harbor and mm -hmm. one of the things that, that some of their work pointed out is that the elevation of that pumping station is low and we've, we've asked Tom to maybe reach out to you and, and to the sewer commission just, you know, while, while we're going to take some steps to, to raise the height of the wharfs themselves, um, it, it does sort of feel like a point of vulnerability and the, you know. the commission did have an assessment done. Oh, great! Um, through their engineer, and there is a report. Okay. There are some recommendations. Um, I couldn't go through them right now, but sure. there is recommendations for each station that that is vulnerable to um, increasing tides. Okay. okay. Well, and thank you because I know you, you. There may be other stations in in mm -hmm. um, other areas of town. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else for Randy? You know, thank you and, and your team for all, all the great things that you do. It's um, uh, your department touches so many parts of the town, and um, uh, we just really appreciate you know all the all the great work and the responsiveness and the professionalism of, of all the people that that are part of your team. Thank you. They're a good team. You're a good team. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Randy. Have a good night. Thank you, too. Okay, our next contestant. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Vicki Donlin from the Recreation Commission and the Director of the Recreation Department, Mark Thoreau. <clears throat> if you Welcome. turn to page 104 in your books. So the Recreation Budget is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a simple salary line item, and their salary line is moving contractually from $95,054 to $95,158, and that is um, in large part just an increase in the, in the longevity payment for the director's salary. Okay. Other than that, they're here for questions. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you know, you're always, it, it's always really helpful to see all the great backup that you provide because well, the, the town budget is responsible for a portion of the activity, and I'm just going to highlight a few things that jumped out to me on here, but I, I you know, invite you to add, add anything significant that I missed. Um, uh, 100, 135 employees, $1.4 million in revenue, 200 self-funded programs, you operate the town pool, 2,300 children enrolled in a summer program, um, online registration, uh, 
maintenance of uh, a lot of fields uh, fully maintained and um, I would just also add that um, and, and Mark in particular you know for your efforts um, you and Jay McGrail uh, together just are doing a lot of great work on behalf of the town and um, we appreciate we appreciate not only what you're doing uh, and the Commission is doing within the rec but also um, the great partnerships that you're developing with with other groups in town that that are kind of in a similar line of, of services yes thank you um, I was going to mention that yeah one of the big positives for this year was our strengthening partnership with the country club um, for the first time ever we had the privilege of managing the, the town pool um, and I think it was a big success this year had 400 memberships sold and 500 kids either attended a swim lesson or were on the swim team. Um, we also um, created a sports program at the country club this summer where the kids rotated between um, tennis, uh, golf, and swimming um, for grades uh, two through eight. And that was a huge success with 375 kids um, attended throughout the eight weeks. Um, so we're hoping to expand and do um, additional things this upcoming summer. Um, and then I would say one other positive for this past year was the opening of the rec yes. barn. Um, I'd like to mention that September through May, we have um, 36 classes, pre-registration classes that are run weekly, um, and that's um, 540 kids or adults who are utilizing the rec barn. Um, that's September to May, and then June through August, um, approximately 1,200 kids from different summer programs rotating in there doing different activities. Um, and then it also serves the public, being a, a public bathroom for anyone from the playground to the tennis courts to the soccer field. Terrific. It's a great building. Yeah. Anything to add? Uh, I'm happy to see your initiative on the Canterbury Street Playground. I think that's a great move. No, th thank you. We're re really excited to hopefully move forward with that with the CPC. Yeah. One thing I did notice you um, in some of the backup, you look at different programs, and I was I was surprised when I looked at it that the fitness center that's here in town is not cash flow positive. Is that you know? Could could you maybe just kind of speak to the the fitness the fitness room? Sh sure. So. For many years, it's been um, negative, mm -hmm. but it's usually been about ten or fifteen thousand um, dollars, and we kind of always chalk that up to um, more being neutral because whether we have the fitness room open or not, we need someone on duty with all the other programs that are running either early in the morning or at night. Um, but now it's reached a level of this past year we lost forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So. Um, in communication with um, Human Resources and Tom and the Rec Commission um, and also Town Insurance and Town Council, we've kind of come up with a game plan um, where we feel comfortable moving forward, where we think we're going to get back to breaking e even on it. Okay. I think to, just to add to your question, however, though, um, because 10 years ago the fitness room was really thriving, but competition in the area planet fitness which is you know relatively inexpensive mm. and um, and then in Cohasset um, all of a sudden I can't think of the fitness center but between that and webs and um, the Weymouth Club I mean we are surrounded by fitness yes. areas so but particularly planet fitness was I think a, a, a big um, hit to our fitness room yep. because of the cost mm -hmm. You might wonder if it's struggling so much, why keep it open? We actually have 700 members still. Um, I was wondering how many members you have. Yeah. Um, we do have some free memberships that some um, we're looking at that structure now. So we're attacking the problem from a couple different angles. Um, and we're confident that we can get back to breaking even on it. But I also want to add, because you just heard from Elder Services, we have over 175-year-olds and older. So. 
um, to me, they're not going to Planet Fitness, right. that's for sure. Right. And so um, whether it the, hits the red rec department's budget, I mean, it's a critical asset to, uh, to the town, whether they're elder service members or whether they're just coming and it's in the same building. So it's mm -hmm. critically important to that um, constituency as well. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, Karen or Paul, anything else? Good. One thing I'd just like to say is I'd like to thank Mark, as always, for his... Um, is he's, he's a wonderfully communicative uh, director of, of the rec department. Uh, he keeps me informed of what's going on. Uh, he comes to our department head meetings. He's just a he's a um, he's a terrific department head, and, uh, and I just want to call off that. Oh, so thank, thank you, Tom. You for everything you do. Well, thank you, and we appreciate you both coming in tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. you very much. Have a good night. Good night. You too. Holiday too. Enjoy, <laughs> right, Vicky. Hey. Um. All of our department hit, or our, our budget hearings tonight. We do not have any um, appointments for this evening. Um, Tom, select and report. I mean, town administrator <laughs> report. Sorry. Did I get a promotion? <laughs> <laughs> do you really want to sit here? No, thank you. I'm good. <laughs> Switch paychecks with you. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have a, 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 a okay. administrator report to share tonight. Uh, <clears throat> briefly, uh, I would like to thank the um, Resurrection uh, Church sixth grade CCD. Uh, a very nice woman named Marianne um, Minasali. Okay, you know her. Yep. Yep. Um, she had the young people in her class make wreaths for the Blue Star families, and um, I was. We were the recipient of one of those uh, over the weekend. I was really touched by that. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to the sixth grade class and, and Ms. Menasali for remembering um, those of our residents that wear the uniform of our country. Um, well, I, I mentioned the, the CAFR showed up on all of our desks, and I think that that is a, a tribute to the entire financial team for the town. Um, really well done um, by, by everybody, you know, Sue in particular. Um, I'm continuing, continuing to work on uh, housing and veterans issues um, in particular over the last couple of weeks. And um, you, you'll likely mention it, but uh, tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, and Mary and I had the um, special privilege of attending a menorah lighting at the um, the shipyard tonight, which was really a, a just a great gathering. Um, so, yeah. um, and uh, I had two things. Uh, first of all, I had the uh, I had the honor of attending um, uh, an event at GAR Hall on Saturday that the VFW sponsored to recognize uh, winners of their essay contest. And um, it was just a wonderful community event. Um, I thank in particular Herm Mesmer for his, for his uh, leading that and organizing it. Uh, congratulations to the students. And also they recognized three, a few of the teachers um, at St. Paul's and at Hingham High School and at Hingham Middle School who um, really are keeping this program alive and, and uh, so it was just a really, uh, it was a really nice, uh, nice event. And uh, the other thing, and I, I checked with Dr. Gallo this afternoon, um, Hingham received uh, notification, uh, we received notification uh, by mail from the MSBA that um, that uh, they they did not they are not offering us uh, an opportunity to work on foster school in this round of funding. Um, I don't have a letter in front of me, but they had a very large number of applicants. Eighty three, I think. Yeah, and um, they can only invite a certain number into the program because of funding limitations. But also in that letter, they pointed out that. Um, a new a new round and uh, new statements of interest that will open up in January and um, so uh, the school school committee uh, with the school building committee is is looking at looking at options um, and where that might go I think we've been lucky we've been very fortunate in Hingham um, on two different occasions um, our first request to be uh, entered into the program was accepted um, I think since that time the program is in great demand because there are many communities uh, with very worthy projects. Um, 
I think uh, so. I think we move forward, and uh, uh, January is 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 only a few weeks away. Um, so uh, I think with that, our next meeting is Tuesday, uh, December nineteenth. We'll hopefully be finishing up our budgets, um, and uh, we did have an executive session on the agenda for tonight, but we will not be having that. So uh, I would accept adjourn. the motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Good night.